Okay, so before we get going, just quickly, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Kelsey Nichols. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator and the Coordinator of the Signal Boost Initiative with Reforest London. So if you're wondering what the connection is with Reforest London um, and you're not familiar with who we are, um, we are a London-based uh, charitable nonprofit that uh, partners with the community to enhance the environmental and human health through the benefits of trees. So we're well known for tree planting and tree giveaways and things like that, but we're also the founders of the new environmental center, the Westminster Pond Center. Um, so this new project founded in 2019 um, will soon become an environmental hub for London and the surrounding region um, full of uh, services and programs about all kinds of environmental topics. Um, and so one of the programs we're doing is um, an educational program called the Signal Boost Initiative. And it aims to dramatically increase the quantity and quality of uh, environmental education opportunities in the region. Um, and so that's why we're hosting these webinars. Um, so eventually the events will be at the center, but in the meantime, during COVID, they're online. So uh, I just want to quickly acknowledge the program uh, funder, the Ontario Trillium Foundation and Reforest London's uh, lead sponsor since 2009, Canada Life. So that's uh, it for that slide. I just wanted to mention that, um, so we don't have any other upcoming events uh, that are currently set right now, but if you're interested uh, in learning more about other events that we're going to be doing, just visit reforcelondon.ca, and if you ever have questions um, about logistics or anything, um, there's my email there. And now I'm just going to quickly introduce our speakers tonight. So they are just one moment. So we are very lucky to uh, welcome Tom Heeman. He's the president of the Berry Growers of Ontario and the vice president of Alice Middlesex, as well as Peter Model, who is the coordinator of Alice Middlesex. And he also works for the Lower Thames Conservation Authority. So I'll pass it off to you and take it away. All right, well, Thank you for uh, having us here this evening. Uh, it's a real pleasure to um, talk to you about something that's very close to, to our uh, hearts and um, you know our our day to day activities. So um, we have uh, a little bit of an outline and kind of a a, a rough guide of kind of how we're going to talk about um, different types of ecosystem services and and how you can bring that home uh, not only to um, your garden. Uh, or your own little uh, veggie garden for food, but also how that uh, translates to some of the activities that we can do in, in the, the larger food system and in agriculture. So um, we have just a little bit of an intro on what Alice Middlesex uh, is and, and what we do uh, in the Middlesex community. Uh, that, and I'm just gonna start out our conversation by talking about uh, kind of my personal journey with um, with how I started to take take more uh, care and attention to uh, some of the, the relationships between insects and plants um, on our farm, and then also just um, you know some of the activities that we've taken to to um, improve those activities, and we're we're going to talk specifically about the plant services uh, underneath kind of a uh, ecosystem services framework. And looking at exactly what uh, they can can do for your own little environment. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about species hosts, um, how they connect to uh, the agri-food system, um, gardening, uh, and then again how these plants are providing nutrition in kind of the uh, the ecosystem, as it were. Uh, how that connects to the bloom cycle, and how we have to bring that together with insect life cycles, so we have a good quality. Uh, good availability and at the right time. And all that leads to um, kind of a, a, a support uh, framework for helping you pick your own plants uh, for your own backyard and, and on the basis of what you want to accomplish for that particular setting. And, and again, uh, some bigger examples about how uh, we've been able to use those approaches uh, successfully on, on our own uh, farm uh, growing strawberries. So I'm going to pass it over uh, to Peter here. Thanks, Tom and Kelsey. Uh, <clears throat> it's great to be here tonight. 
Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Alice, uh, we're a local nonprofit here operating in uh, Middlesex County. Um, we're a local program uh, who work with farmers and agricultural uh, leaders to restore the natural landscape um, in the county here. Uh, let's get into it right here, starting with ecosystem services. So ecosystem services are any positive benefit that the natural environment provides to humans, and they are at the core of the ALICE program. We hope to achieve these with each and every project. These ecosystem services provided by our projects can benefit the greater community here in Middlesex County. Some of the services that are provided through these projects are cleaner water, cleaner air, and providing habitat for wildlife. We'll go through a couple of our projects now to provide some real life examples of these. The first one here is a wetland creation project. Uh, these slides really show the difference a year can make in these projects. Wetlands are an important feature of the landscape and can have a beneficial relationship with agriculture. This wetland provides many different benefits as it acts as a natural filtration system. Wetland plants can absorb excess nutrients and chemicals from field runoff capture sediments, and also act as a carbon sink and help with water control. It provides a diverse habitat for pollinator species, which help us grow food. So how can we sustain both agriculture and the natural environment? The ALICE program aims to do, do, to do both by undertaking projects on just marginal or environmentally sensitive lands and working directly with farmers. Marginal farmland are often areas that are unproductive or no longer economically feasible to farm anymore. Some causes of, and examples of this are areas that are difficult to reach with modern farming equipment. With increasing tractor and equipment sizes, many of these old fields that used to be farmed are no longer accessible. Another one is if the land is unproductive or has a low yield. And the cause of this may be underlying reasons such as sloping terrain, or having erosion problems, or perhaps being seasonally wet. Spots like these can often be better suited at growing ecosystem services. In this picture, we have a one acre area that was hard to reach with large equipment, uh, so accessibility was down, as well as there's a low-lying area that had water pooling in wet seasons. So the farmer couldn't really get back there. Um, he was losing money on it each year. Um, so he contacted Alice and wanted to do something with this land. Um, to make it better. The next slide there. Um, using the natural features of this site and planning with biodiversity in mind, we came up with a restoration project that fit the site and the farmer's needs. As you can see in the picture, this top one acre field was stored with native Carolinian trees, which help with carbon sequestration and provide terrestrial upland habitat, complementing the neighboring wetland. In the low-lying area, we excavated and enhanced the area to provide aquatic habitat and capture and filter nutrients from the nearby agricultural field. By managing these marginal lands differently, we can keep prime agricultural lands in production and producing food, but also receive these ecosystem services at the same time. Um, one of the ways to support this program and um, see more projects like this done on the landscape is through the New Acre Project. This offers a way for businesses and corporations, a platform for them to get involved and better their local community and environment. Individuals can also get involved through making donations at alice.ca, which coincidentally makes a great Christmas gift. Let me just switch to the next slide there. I did, I did it's just lagging. Oh, okay. It's the Bluebird? The one after yeah, that. the Bluebird? Okay. Yep. Yeah, but it's still on there. I mean, switch to the, the pack. Um, That's what so I behind the middle, Dallas Middlesex program is a dedicated group of volunteers. Okay, perfect. Um, so behind Dallas Middlesex, this group is made up of local farmers all here in Middlesex County who are interested in the environment and are the driving force behind the program. Pictured here in the back 
is our Vice President, Tom Heeman. Tom wears many different hats. You may have seen him around in the community. He has a passion for pollinators and plants. He has a really great presentation tonight, which I'm sure you'll enjoy. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so uh, I'm just gonna kind of start at the beginning uh, of, again, my kind of personal journey, because uh, that's generally how I make sense of these things is through my own experiences. And uh, it started, uh, to be honest, with just taking a little bit more um, attention uh, in my experiences with uh, the environment and just, you know, looking at things and saying, you know, what is that? I, I, and if I don't know, to try and identify it and, uh, you know, build, build that knowledge base from uh, just from what plants I was encountering in my everyday. And so here's just, just uh, a little bit of a taste in terms of how, um, how I start to look at the world is that, you know, as a farmer, we're always looking at the seasons. And I think if you look at the plants, the plants are going to tell you what, what season it is a lot more than, you know, the farmer's almanac or, you know, even the weather channel now. And again, how, how the spring is progressing, the, the bloom cycle really starts to, to give you an idea in, in, in how all, all those things are working together. So my, one of my clues, um, when things like it's the beginning of the season is when you start to see that those that first push of red maple pollen and at the end of uh, the season you start to see some of those early uh, blooms of uh, common witch hazel which is something that you could see out on the landscape now surprising as it may be um, but again if you're a bee that's all you see so uh, again uh, that that uh, experience of starting to observe my environment uh, really began, I would say, about six years ago when we uh, hosted uh, a, a local beekeeper on our farm. And, and um, it was at that time where there was a lot of kind of, I would say, uh, fighting and contention about the environment in agriculture. Um, there was the whole uh, neonicotinoid uh, debate uh, and with uh, grain croppers and seed treatments. Uh, uh, and along with the Ontario beekeepers and, and the issues that that was causing for, for hive health. So we thought it would be a good thing to, you know, see what's actually going on on, on our farm and uh, learn more about pollinator health by bringing some, some bees on, onto the farm. And uh, shortly after that, again, it's starting to think, okay, what is, what is uh, feeding these bees? What, like, how do they take care of themselves and, and get carbohydrates and protein um, throughout the throughout the season. And it was by, you know, just looking all around you know, our fence rows, little corners, looking at the weeds and just starting to think about them in a different way. And it was, you know, a period of time in, in June where uh, we had uh, here these um, wild white roses uh, blooming. And uh, I thought, you know what? it's about time I start to get some of my own hives. And that's exactly what we did. And uh, from those experiences, uh, I got three hives uh, in mid-July. And uh, today, now we have uh, 115 hives and it's we're on our fourth year of that. And it's just kind of grown from there. And it's really taught me a lot about, um, about where I live and uh, again, how we're actually interacting with the environment and you know, this is, there's been some discussion of nature blindness uh, in the past about how um, we, we don't know how to see the world around us. And I think that that all starts with looking at the plants and again, the signals that they send to us. So uh, with our journey, uh, we started making uh, varietal honeys and that was a way to say, okay, if you have all this abundance in nature uh, and the bees are collecting that and in the nectar and the pollen, and uh, what does that look like? And, and you can actually start to taste distinctive differences based on those, those uh, resources the bees are bringing in at, at different times of the year. Um, they're just capturing that abundance. And again, it was a way that I could connect uh, with the environment. And again, uh, try and use that to connect with the public to, to talk about how all these connections between um, uh, our impacts and, and plants and, and using bees as that, uh, that uh, nexus point that keeps us all connected. Um, so there's, there's again, uh, I, I would, there's a couple other, I would call them influential resources uh, and, and pieces to my thinking at that time, like this, this book, uh, Pollinators of Native Plants by 
Heather Holm. Like you'll see some other references to her work and she's got some really great graphics that uh, truly explain the diversity of all, all of the pollinators. Um, you know, it, it says it right there on the cover. Like there's a lot of things other than bees that uh, do a lot of work in the environment. The one that always jumps out at me is, is beetles. And we don't really think of that, but it, again, like uh, beetles are doing they're do, they're doing work to move things around. Some of the first pollinators evolved are beetles, and that's what the older that the older the plant is genetically, the larger the flowers are. If you look at um, some really cool things like uh, magnolias, again very large blooms because they were relying on uh, large larger arthropods and, and beetles specifically at that point in time to try and attract uh, things to move move around their genetic material. Um, and again. Uh, on, on the berry farm, part of uh, starting to think about bees and starting to think about insects uh, and understanding their cycles in different ways, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, challenges growing berries uh, in terms of things that are uh, directly trying to eat our crop. And that, that, is, a, that is a challenge. And uh, so the, part of re-looking at our connection with the environment is, is how are there ways that we can solve these problems aside from just kind of the conventional uh, approach of, of, using, uh, of using chemistry. And uh, so there was some really, really work at that time uh, and uh, it's a place like California, Quebec, and uh, some, some innovative growers in Ontario were, were looking at ways that they could plant, um, plant certain um, uh, selections of flowers and use those as a, as a feedstock to keep um, beneficial insects uh, in their fields. Uh, and so it's kind of a combination of these two, like m these two experiences, A as a beekeeper and B as a berry grower, trying to uh, find a better way forward that led to uh, some of the, the research and the, the approaches that we're going to be talking about. So again, um, two instrumental uh, books in, in my journey is uh, Our Native Bees. And again, uh, I find that uh, bees is a really good way to understand uh, an insect's life cycle and, and how they work as a as a, call, a hive instrument or a hive organism, and uh, and how they can uh, how, how they work again in the environment. We always think about plants and the weather uh, and the climate, but again, when you if you use just a little bit of you know thinking outside your own shoes, starting to think about insects. What is the world to an insect like? That that's what beekeeping has has helped me accomplish. But then again. Beekeeping, bee, bees are a domesticated insect. It's something that uh, humans and bees have been, or um, honeybees have been evolving for thousands of years together. Uh, but what we don't pay attention to, and unfortunately it's because they don't uh, have that wonderful honey, is the native bees and the native pollinators that, uh, that were here in North America before we brought the, uh, the colonial bees. So even though that's a, something that uh, is providing a service now, I always try and think, why is it that we have to substitute this? And if we enhanced our environment, will we not get some of those native bees back and native service, or that those na um, natural pollination services? And, um, you know, we, we, uh, we have a blue, wild blueberry honey, and that's with, uh, with honeybees. But again, wild blueberries have been evolving on North America for a, a long time. Uh, and they have evolved native pollinators, but through human activity, we've eliminated those native pollinators, and that's why we have to truck bees across across the the country. So again, there's there's little lessons in, in how we use uh, honeybees now as to uh, what we've lost in in other um, in other places and times. So that this book uh, was uh, was very helpful in again making some of those connections explicitly clear. And again, uh, providing a pathway to understanding things beyond uh, beyond the honeypot, so to speak. Uh, and bringing bringing nature home has uh, some good examples about again how how we uh, we don't really um, we tend to think our, our backyard is is separate. You know that's that's our property, but again, it's it is part of the ecosystem. It is part of the environment, and through conscious acts, we can. Uh, reinforce those relationships and interconnectivity. Um, so, I, and again, a lot of the things that we're talking about, about plant and um, insect relationships directly come from the principles in that book. So one thing that uh, I'm just kind of very conscious of is 
um, it, we, again, there's a discussion that we live in the Anthropocene, which unfortunately means that uh, we live in a period of time where human activity is more uh, is is influencing the environment more than anything else in history, uh, and that provides a I think a unique challenge. If you think back 200 years ago, which isn't really that long, um, you know, <laughs> uh, that uh, all of this was at some point uh, on un relatively undisturbed nature. And that through our own activity, we've um, distanced ourselves from that. And everything that we see, we have consciously constructed through uh, through regulation and through settlement and and through what we've been trying to do to meet our needs of food, food, shelter, health, and happiness. And I think that um, we, human activity directly can play a role in, in improving that. And again, we have we don't we're never going to get back to the perfect undisturbed nature. Uh, but that also means that we have a unique opportunity to bring them together, um, both it, bring them together in a, in a way that's never been been done before. And I think there's some creativity there between domesticated plants and uh, full full native uh, genetically diverse plants. And I have this picture of the, the honeybee on uh, a spring viola, because again, there's all kinds of uh, uh, violets uh, violets or violas out in the wild, and again, I think you can you can find some of those nice purples and uh, the the spring violet is purple, straight purple, or the yellow uh, downy vi downy wood violet in the spring. And again, uh, because we are inherently attracted to flowers, there's been a lot of work to domesticate them and and even and bring out even more colors and creativity. So I, I think that. Um, the, there is a lot of opportunity in your garden and again uh, anywhere that you can possibly plant a seed to to increase diversity and to increase um, health and hab habitat for the ecosystem along with giving you something to smile about uh, and that's this is usually something this is one of the first times we see I see the bees out in the spring and that's because at the greenhouse here we we grow the those uh, violas inside and as soon as it's as soon as it's warm enough we bring them outside and it's the same thing with the bees like they, as soon as you have a nice day they want to be out there and these violas have a nice smell that really attracts them so it's always kind of a, a nice sign of spring where i can can walk out i can i can smell the fresh flowers and i can see the bees coming so if we talk about directly how uh, insects um if affect uh, what I would call the agri-food uh, system, which again, you know, that can be anything from your, your flower garden, your, your, your raised bed flower garden, all the way up to um, large intensive um, an annual cropping or what we do in fruit uh, with the perennial crops. And again, things that we all can do to um, raise food at, at different scales and um, with different skills. I think that the two things that, um, that uh, that you can get out of insects is uh, what's known as kind of uh, beneficial uh, insect control through uh, the use of natural enemies, and again the the pollination benefits that help uh, help get that full uh, full fertilization of, of flowers to to create um, nice healthy uh, reproductive <laughs> tissues, which we enjoy as in the form of you know apples and and uh, and strawberries and blueberries and, and all those great things. So it, it's kind of interesting how insects also they they're they're at the beginning of of creating life through that act of pollination, which is a plant just trying to, you know, put another generation uh, on the earth and pass on all those little genetic secrets that uh, they're trying to uh, to to capture and reproduce to uh, to survive on this planet. And and again, the the insects that are are trying to uh, consume those plants. For their own sustenance, so there are. It's kind of interesting how we've used plants to uh, meet our needs, and insects are doing the same thing. And we're just trying to stay alive through another s cycle in the food chain. So yeah, that's kind of uh, how. I, those are at least the levels that we're going to talk about. Um, and again, there's a lot of different diversity and how all those things work together. Um, is kind of unique to, to unfold and uh, and learn about with your own uh, fruits and vegetables in your backyard. Or again, just if you want to have butterfly habitat because you think that we should have more butterflies and that's a good thing. There's an, there are tools to do that and plants are right in the in the middle. So again, um, 
So talking about natural insect control, which is something that again was was part of my journey and and how do how do we uh, naturally manage pests in our berry crops? Um, there's kind of two different um, two different uh, schools, which is the direct predators, which is kind of where you know it's like the the lion and the antelope, uh, and so you can see um, that ladybug there in the corner. It's it's directly munching on some aphids. And uh, same the one above it. It's uh, it's called miniature pirate bug. So they will they will directly feed on other insects uh, to um, to get their own sustenance. Whereas the uh, parasitoids, um, they're kind of more like your alien, um, you know, laying eggs inside of another uh, insect and uh, using that to uh, perpetuate their offspring. So it's it's kind of neat, and there's a little example of how that even connects back to pollinators um, on another slide. But those those are the two ways that uh, you can harness the power of I would say the food chain uh, in food production. Uh, and so by looking at what these insects need, then uh, we can we can uh, in, increase their abundance again by by giving them the the tools uh, and resources to be successful. And then hopefully they accomplish uh, goals that are similar to ours. So, and then the other one we're talking about pollination. Um, we're th there's. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit on bees, and there's so many pollinators to talk about. So we're going to talk about uh, bees and butterflies a little bit later on. Um, but again, this isn't uh, this isn't uh, a full entomology uh, lecture. Uh, but again, like within within that uh, bee family, within uh, that group, there is a lot more diversity than just honeybees. There's over 600 different types of uh, bees in in southern Ontario, and this just kind of outlines some um, all the different niches that they have. Um, you know, you have the colony form. Some of them are. Some of them are solitary bees, some of them are, are colony forming, again, like bumblebees and honeybees, um, but they, they all have evolved to serve different, uh, different niches and different habitats and, and to accomplish uh, different goals uh, in the ecosystem. And again, there's a lot of different diversity in just their own, um, uh, you know, uh, architecture and their, their mouth parts. And that's kind of one of the connections in terms of um, how, uh, how they all serve different evolutionary niches is that they've evolved to 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 work with different pollinators and on that uh, through those connections and the, and the type of pollination benefits that they provide uniquely the, then you have coevolution and you have a path for uh for selecting uh, hab, uh habitat and and then again increasing uh, the abundance of the resources that they need and then preserving uh, the biodiversity uh, and species at risk just by understanding what the what their uh, environmental needs are so again like these are just another example of the diversity of bees and this is a chart from uh heather home and, and again a couple more influences uh, in in my journey in terms of um how we can use these native plantings uh at scale to increase the abundance of uh, pollinators and of uh, uh predators or beneficial in insects. So there's this, the one uh, example about blueberries, uh, Peter will know because I always talk his ear off about it when, uh, when we're together is, uh, is about how, you know, just planting a uh, hundred square meters of, um, of wildflowers actually allows you to control aphids in, in a commercial blueberry planting. And I, that was really a turning point for me where you think, okay, this is, this is not just, um, In many cases. So, and again, uh, another example of um, intercropping strips of a that we'll talk about a little bit more in commercial lab. They're get they're achieving uh, commercial control of aphids in a commercial setting 
uh, in California. So through, and that's that's an organic practice and an, and an organic uh, lettuce crop. So in, in that system of production. So again, uh, I alluded to it a little bit about uh, quality habitat. And again, it's insects are the primary building blocks of the whole food chain. So um, one thing to start with, again, native plants that have co-evolved with, um, with insects uh, in the same environment to uh, the world, shall I say, and uh, that you, uh, do, do you interact with our environment and insects, they just, they work with what's available, they work with abundance and they, um, sugars, sugar to them at that point, uh, regardless of how the plants compete each other and uh, they don't discriminate on that basis. So there is a unique hybrid there. And again, the challenge of invasive species uh, is something that we have to manage. But again, quality habitat uh, with native plants and an abundance of, uh, of blooms providing good sources of, of sugar and protein is critical. And again, um, on the second point about all seasons blooming, uh, we'll go a little bit more into specific insect uh, life cycles. But generally, um, you want to have a full season of, of flowers, or at least have have, uh, have that bloom cycle fully extended, and uh, that that from the very beginning to the very end. Um, but again, there are there are some specific exceptions, but we'll go through a couple of those in terms of uh, how that directly affects uh, different insect reproductive cycles. Um, so. Yeah, part of that is that you need something for adults, you need something for the, uh, the larval stages. Um, and then part of the larval stage is that eventually when they decide to uh, metamorphosize or, or go through their next uh, stage in life, they do need uh, some protected habitat. And uh, for, a lot, for a lot of pollinators, that, that is direct next nesting sites. And we'll look at some of those differences. And again, for you, if you're used to bees in a box, that's just, just one of the places that they live. And in the, the larger realm of pollinators, that's the exception to the rule. You know, we, we put those bees in, the, bees in a box so we can move them around and that we can interact with them. But that's, that's not one of the ways that, uh, that most of them uh, find themselves. So and again, part of, part of that, this all goes towards quality habitat and uh, that, uh, that can be, you know, uh, protection from uh, predators and, if, if the, that's what you want, but more specifically, you got to think of human beings as predators and, you know, freedom from, uh, let, let's call it adverse impacts from, uh, um, from chemicals and spray free environments. And we're pretty fortunate in Ontario not to have, um, uh, to, to have the commercial, to have the commercial pesticide ban that uh, reduces a lot of that availability of those chemistries in, um, in, in the residential environment. So uh, again, some, something to consider uh, when you're looking at the, the types of um, types of, of insects, and, and again, going back to the, the different uh, uh, architecture that they have, the different uh, body structures, the mouth shape, is again, certain flowers through that co-evolution have their resources available uh, more or less, and that determines the access that uh, different um, pollinators can get to it and, and or uh, beneficial insects. And it just so happens that there, there are patterns that emerge between different, uh, different uh, flower structures and different groups of, uh, of pollinators and insects. So that's another way we can select for the uh, type of um, diversity that we've, we want to promote. And again, in a gardening setting, uh, if we want beneficial insects, again, they, we have to provide um, flowers that have accessible uh, nectar and pollen resources. Uh, the other thing to consider is uh, at, different, uh, at different scales and again, uh, at different sizes, there's different levels of availability to uh, those insects. So the general rule of thumb here is if it's a smaller insect, its world is a little bit smaller, right? So if you go 
all the way down to that uh, bicolored sweat bee at the bottom there. Uh, it has a much narrower um, field of travel than the, the monarch butterfly that goes all the way from southern Ontario down to, to Mexico every year. So there, there is a very large difference in scale and, and then what you can actually, what the insects are looking for to, to meet their, their resources. Which presents an opportunity where the actions in your own backyard can be significant um, to some of those smaller insects. So uh, here again is just an example as we start to talk specifically about some, some plants. Uh, this is a resource from the uh, uh, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, they produced a, quite a long time ago, but it's still very, um, very helpful because this is about bees. And again, we look at honeybees as that pathway into our economic incentive to care about insects. What's unique about the study that they did at that time is they looked at, uh, you know, the the not only the the ne the honey or the nectar resources, but it's again about the crude protein. We, you know, all all human civilizations are built off of uh, two primary uh, plant ingredients, right? In North America, it was corn and beans. Uh, in the Middle East, you have wheat and and chickpeas. And you know, in East Asia, you have rice and again a uh, common bean. So there there is a unique kind of uh, again connection to the food chain at our macro level that still is critically important in the quality and quantity of, of uh, nutrition available to, to insects. So I thought this was kind of a neat example because it, it tells you, you know, just the actual percentage of crude protein uh, in, in, the different, um, in the different pollen sources. And again, the amino acid complex, that's why um, most humans need at the bare minimum two different, um, two different plant sources because you have complementary amino acid complexes. Um, whereas some of these plants, they, they have a nice full spectrum of amino acids and, you know, it's kind of one gets you all, all nine. Uh, but again, that's not always the case. And again, when we look at the seasonal availability of some of these, these flowers, that there can be critical gaps throughout the year where those resources are not available. And that's something that, again, we can, we can influence with our own decisions. Uh, for greater uh, health outcomes for for insects. So just a quick rundown of kind of the top 10 bee plants. And uh, again, I'm, I'm using this, this bee argument as a loose connector for um, the other pollinators and, and beneficial insects. So just kind of going in order of the season, uh, some of the first uh, quality pollen sources available is willow. And that, that's even earlier than the, the red maple, uh, depending on, on where that willow is situated in the landscape and, and the type of spring that we have. So those, those two are kind of neck and neck and uh, good native sources. Uh, following that, there's the, the Norway maple. Um, uh, so not native, but again, like that was, that was an eye-opening experience for me is that, you know, you, you have this blustery spring day and it's just horrible out, but you see these bright lime green flowers uh, poking out of the, the twigs of the Norway maple and say, huh, well, darn if that don't look like a flower. Uh, and yeah, they are there and they are an early uh, source, source of, uh, of uh, nutrition. Uh, so that's followed by um, the sugar maples. So it's kind of a neat, uh, there's a little bit of a neat connection uh, occurring here, which is that some of the early, early um, pollen sources uh, and sources of nutrition are actually from trees. So again, we think about different levels of succession in the ecosystem. Uh, it's it's kind of neat that the, that how they they overlap and and some of the annuals can kick in later in the year, whereas those early perennials they've evolved to really take advantage of the full growing season. If they have an established root system and all their vascular tissue, they know what's good and they're going to start early. Um, uh, so just a little anecdote here too. Um, the um, elm trees. There's it's kind of an uh, 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 an old folk tale in the beekeeping world is that uh, bees really weren't the same after Dutch elm disease. And again, that's because elm is an, another really early um, producer. 
uh, of of uh, an abundance of of blossoms. So it, it it provided a really good early protein nectar nectar source in the spring, and uh, again with that uh, that threat to to that uh, species, they're just not the same uh, level of elm trees. They they kind of get to you know 15 centimeters across, and then they just succumb to the disease, which doesn't really allow for a lot of mature elms in that same food source in the landscape. So um, again, when you get into early June, you start to see some of those nice visual white uh, flowers from the, the black locust. And uh, I love going down uh, Veterans Memorial Parkway because they are, they're just all over that roadside. They, they, can, be, uh, they can be pretty vigorous and, and invasive, but this is one that I don't really mind because it's just such an amazing, uh, amazing source of nutrition. Uh, I, one of my best bee yards is because there is a really good quantity of um, really good quantity of uh, black locusts around it. And again, it's kind of funny because it's surrounded by gravel pits, but as an, a very aggressive tree uh, and kind of a primary successor tree, it's done really well there in, in despite the odds of that, uh, that activity. So you can see again, like uh, we're, we're getting, when, as we round out the rest of the top 10, we are seeing some more annual species and some biannual species. So dandelions, again, they come from Europe, but they are just so abundant and massive. They are all over the landscape. And they, that is something that you, you really see a bump in the numbers uh, of, of, of insects largely built off of that, uh, that bloom event. Bloom event. Um, so canola um, is, canola is uh, again, a domestic crop, um, more common out west. There is some in Ontario, but it does have a cousin in the, uh, the wild mustards. So you can see a, a wild yellow mustard. And again, uh, Dame's Rocket is, um, it's a, that bright, Dame's Rocket or Princess Rocket is that bright pink um, uh, flower that's usually in the hedgerows. Uh, again, that's, that's similar time. Um, so it's kind of neat. That whole mustard family does provide um, a lot of good uh, good nectar source at that period in time. Um, fo so followed by uh, Dutch white clover, and it's kind of between dandelions and clover. That's really your honey crop. That's where there's just so many blooms. And uh, again, June and July, you're in a nice park. You just see all those little white flowers, and uh, you you look closely. You're gonna I, you're gonna see bees. It's just if there's bees in the area, they will be on the clover in that period of time. Uh, so a nice little bookend on the the tree bloom is the uh, basswood or or our linden trees. Uh, so those are kind of common in in both Europe and uh, North America, and there's a lot of different diversity in them. But uh, yeah, so they're the North Americans are species is known more commonly as the basswood and Europeans are lind lindens there and there's uh, so both are available and they make a really nice uh, shade tree and again uh, some of the some of the late uh, the real late tree bloom uh, is is the the, the basswood and uh, coming in the, in June and July so again more nectar but again you have so many you have such a large population off of the that early brood uh, off the trees and the the dandelions that they're they just go after the those linden trees and they they pack away that that sugar. So again, I don't mean to be too bee focused, but that's one of the lenses through which I look at things, and it's it's what's helped me um, to look at the abundance again. Uh, bird's foot trefoil, uh, it's kind of a clover relative. Uh, it's in the Fabaceae or the pea family. Um, and that's another thing that you can see quite commonly in, in roadsides and um, uh, park areas, um, and, along with alfalfa. So again, two kind of agricultural uh, um, agricultural plants that do uh, provide a lot of nectar resources. And then uh, milkweed, another great great native, uh, along with with goldenrod. And that kind of amongst those plants that that kind of completes the season when like uh, there's still some goldenrod blooming out there with the, the different swings in temperature but that's generally the last uh, the last um, the last crop of significant abundance other than when you get into like some of those small little doses of witch hazel which interestingly is is somewhat medicinal as well that you can go and pick that up in the 
Shoppers Drug Mart. So I always kind of wonder what the connections between the different plants and the, like the plant compounds and aromatics they, that they produce to attract the bees uh, and also the medicinal side effects that we've discovered and that maybe the bee has discovered over time as well. So here's a really great chart that I think puts it together and, and highlights that uh, native um, side of things, uh, which is uh, done by the Xerxes Society. And that's the Society for the Preservation of Invertebrates. And it's named after the Xerxes butterfly that was one of the first, uh, first butterflies to go extinct in, in, the, in the recent century. And it's in, the, in that name that they seek to preserve habitat and pre seek to uh, prevent the extinction of uh, insects. So this is kind of neat in that, you know, it's listed a, uh, this is a recommendation for a seeding mix, but it's also listed in uh, order of bloom cycle. So that's, again, takes, this is a big, uh, the really great resource. This is something that uh, lends very heavily in my thinking. And we have the, the, the links and the, the references for this at the end. And so that will be made available. But again, this is something we start to think about full season bloom, full year bloom, full year long nutrition. What does that look like? This is what it looks like. And by individually planting those, those species, you can contribute to that. So again, here's, here's another example uh, from uh, Heather Holm. And uh, likewise, you know, she's got a lot more information here that is great. Um, you know, it talks about, you know, she's already got on these bar charts, species specificity, how they connect and again, what types of soils do they want? And then some, some of those nice um, gardening information about what's really gonna work for the type of uh, location that you have and that you want to improve. Um, yeah, so again, uh, as we move on, I just wanna emphasize, you, want, you need to have full season long um, abundance of nutrition like this early willow. And you also need to have some species specificity. And here's an example with the, the squash bee that is specifically adapted for the whole pumpkin curcubit um, family of plants, which again, we, we don't always think about it, but pumpkins evolved here in North America with the assistance of the, the first peoples. And they had the help of the, uh, the squash bee to do that. So that moves on to um, how do you pick your plants? Um, and, uh, the one thing you want to consider in conjunction with that is, again, the habitat. So how, how are you creating places for the insects to complete their life cycle? That's, uh, that's something that has to be considered in conjunction uh, with that plant choice. So just a, one last criteria to, to think about. Um, and there, again, we have these two different types of um, reproductive habits. If you go away from kind of like that, that wax colony or that um, you know, even like the honeybee is, is even a cavity nester. It's a big cavity nester. Uh, it's kind of unique. Um, but again, it's, these are a little bit more uh, nuanced um, sh shelter strategies, shall we say. So we have the cavity, cavity nester and here there's a bunch of different examples, but again, they're going out there, they're grabbing those, um, those resources and they have to find a place to store them in order to lay their eggs and feed their young and have their young protected. Um, so this, that's, uh, that, that's one strategy is cavities. And again, uh, those thinking about those straws and stems and uh, leaf debris or um, not leaf debris, but uh, you know, logs and, and openings in, in wood, like you, the directly the carpenter bees can, can make and expand those, those holes and, and they can dig the, dig those little tunnels in the, in the, plant stems. So again, it's something if you're doing your gardening exercise, don't necessarily cut those stems all the way down to the ground. And if you do it a little bit earlier, then you are helping to provide habitat. And again, leaving some of that debris for the next life cycle, for the next year around, uh, is a way that we can positively uh, contribute to habitat and a more successful uh, establishment of insects in our backyard. And again, ground nesting, uh, bees is is another way that uh, both you know pollinators and beneficial insects uh, have um, survival strategies and reproductive strategies and I think that's one of the bigger challenges to to think about uh, when you're creating habitat is that yeah like uh, it's in in agriculture we want to turn that soil over 
So it heats up and it's nice and loose. It's great. It's a great environment for plants to to take off and set down set down roots. Um, and again, because to take full advantage of the growing season. But by doing that, by by cultivating the land, we're going to be disrupting all of those little little pockets and little um, little chambers that uh, and the tunnels that go up to the surface that may. Um, uh, may be developed. So again, it's kind of neat, like perennial crops like asparagus and uh, apple orchards and, you know, even blueberries and, and strawberries to a lesser degree, by not disturbing that soil for a longer period of time, we're providing an opportunity for the, the ground nesting uh, bees to, to develop a, a, a home. So with all this in mind, um, again, here's, here's some more examples of a great resource uh, from the Xerxes Society. Uh, again, there's specific connections and different types of flowers that can create habitat for different types of insects. So, uh, and again, here's another example uh, with the rust, uh, rusty patch bumblebee of both full season uh, food sources and also um, what are they looking for in terms of where they need to make that nest at different times of the year. So what they're looking for in terms of building up their own resources uh, in the spring versus uh, trying to establish and grow a colony uh, right through that mid-season, those are completely different things. And, and that's in beekeeping, that's what we're trying to manage is to manage the success of the colony by making sure that we have enough space and that there's enough uh, resources and abundance to allow that colony to flourish and to really take off. And you can do that same thing for the solitary insects and again for some of the, the native colony form, formers just by having that, that, that right sequence of when, when, a, uh, when a flower is, is going to come into maturity and bloom. And again, here's a pretty neat, uh, unique case of, you know, if you're using echinaceas, a, 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 corn, a, a cone flower, how you can use that to um, a, provide food but then cut it off and provide habitat. Um, yeah, so in short, home is where the brood is for in the insect world. Um, a lot of that's specific to pollinators, but uh, I'm gonna move on to, uh, to butterflies. So that again, same thing. And if you look at two different life cycles, you need to have the nectar source and you also need to have the actual uh, direct vegetation for them to feed on. Uh, which I think is is pretty pretty common for um, for the understanding of you know monarchs with uh, milkweed specifically. But again, there's they do need nectar throughout the whole season. The larva de the larva definitely needs those milkweeds to build up the the toxins to, to as part of their survival strategy. But the adult monarchs they need they need nectar, and again they have longer mouth parts, so they can they can get it in certain specifically uh, adapted plants for their purposes. So again, the, here is a further list of direct relationships between different different butterflies and uh, different um, different plant and tree species again because they do have that unique adaptation and you know some some of the some of the, the toxins that they use for their own uh, survival strategies but um, for the sake of time we'll just leave that for um, for your own uh, exploration after the fact. So the real critical question is, how do you start to choose some plants that make a difference for your own situation? And I, I put to you this list of questions, which uh, hopefully should help um, narrow that down. And again, we're gonna go through a couple more resources in the, the time we have remaining. But um, it all starts out with, again, what's your baseline? What are you starting with? And that will determine, you know, if you, you just, it's, it's, I find that's one of the most rewarding activities is that you just be in your environment and observe it and just do that consistently and, and watch the landscape in front of you change. And so, you know, that, that, and that, that brings you closer to your own situation, but it, it also, it, you're allowing nature, nature to teach you. Um, and I, yeah, that's kind of neat. And so at there's, when there's different times, you say, huh. Uh, I don't see any new buds coming or, oh, there's doesn't seem to be like there's a lot of color here right now and, you know, in the form of flowers. And maybe that's a good good signal to you that maybe this is a, an opportunity to to plant something that has a, a bloom that may fit that. Um, and, you know, go back to some of those charts and you can see what those bloom, like what those bloom times are. 
um, and then you know make the decision where you want to whether you want to put out in seed or in, or in a, a potted plant, and uh, and do that. And again, so what are you trying? What are you trying to host? What do you want more of? And and uh, picking picking plants that uh, benefit them. Again, based on some of those uh, different bloom types, how do they fit together? Again, along with the timing, uh, and again, what's the life cycle of that insect, and how can you support its its reproduction with the different sub-seasonal levels of abundance. Again, all season long, insects are creatures of habit. If they if they are up there flying and they say, oh, there's all there's a lot of white flowers over there, then they start to think on a pattern recognition. How do I keep looking for that? How do I find uh, light patterns that are just blasting out that radiance? And then that just that pathway gets re-ingrained over and over again. And that's they're really creatures of abundance and and so again, the different colors on the landscape and the different bloom periods have um, lent them to evolve that way. And then, but that also serves them better in terms of uh, getting the resources they need. Um, you know, you can give some consideration to nutrition diversity as well, just making sure that there is um, the right full, uh, full, full protein complex uh, or amount of sugar that they need uh, at different times, especially during those dearth periods. And again, nesting sites, it's not enough to feed them. You need to, um, you know, provide the space for the next generation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my own experience and some of the resources that uh, we've used for that. And this is a really great tool. It's something that uh, is done by the Michigan State University, um, their part of their agriculture school, which was um, to, to look Again, just looking at the plants and seeing what shows up. They have created profiles of for over 50 different native plants. Um, what shows up there? They so again, they have natural enemies um, profile. They have the pest profile. Um, so again, if you have something that uh, is going after your your veggies in your garden, the, the, it can tell you whether that's going to make it better or worse. And you know somewhere in the middle because sometimes you want a little bit of a pest, maybe a little bit earlier than the plant that you want to you want to to grow and harvest, so that you can attract the the natural enemies in a timely manner to um, be there as kind of a standing army to take down uh, that threat to 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 your uh, your fruits and vegetables. Um, yeah, so I find this is a, an amazing tool that helps make that decision and, and having those direct relationships. Um, so again, here's here's some more examples about how that works together in terms of those direct relationships for for biocontrol. That they're and again it, that they've done the work with over 50 different plants to to show that uh, different spectrum. Um, but again, the principle applied to commercial fruit production supports that. And again, here's an example in that commercial lettuce field. It is not a lot of area that they needed to get that effect. So it's it's very, very possible. So uh, an example of different ways that you can do the, the planting so that you can have the maximum impact is um, kind of, uh, there's, there's one approach called the hedgerow approach. If you don't have a lot of, a lot of uh, room, or you know, like you do like your lawn, and you know, there's ways you can uh, you can put um, plants in your lawn that do flower and allow you to mow it and have a nice nice area. You can still have a picnic and and uh, kick around a, a soccer ball. Um, but hedgerows are a way that you can get some real nice density on the edge of your um, you know your field or you know on the outside of your um, garden box. You know, some people do that with marigolds where they're, they'll align the outside with marigolds. So this is one example that we've used, uh, that, that I use personally to try and increase the diversity and, um, and largely based on the, the fact that when I did that baseline survey, this, we, we saw some good, uh, good diversity of, um, native plants and specifically here the Canadian anemone which you'll see going back if you look up its profile it is a really great uh, plant to have um, not only for how the time that it blooms but how attractive it is on the landscape. So again you, uh, hedgerows have the benefit of providing habitat and providing nutrition which which gives us that double benefit to, to um, achieve our goals. So again so 
the other tool that we have that that you know you have in in a in an agri food setting is is cover crops. If there's uh, if there's times where you're not directly growing food crops, and you want to let let the land rest. Um, cover crops are a great tool to do that to to increase um, the the nutritional quality. And then there's a number of flowering cover hubs like um, red clovers, and one that I particularly like is this uh, lacy phacelia. It's just a complete uh, bee magnet. That uh, that that's a great choice again, and and it helps uh, sequester nitrogen. And it's native to the western part of North America, which is kind of unique. They grow a lot of it in Europe, but not as much here. So something we can learn from. So, and again, another example of a baseline of uh, natural um, bloom sources, this red osier dogwood uh, that's, you know, like, again, there's a little native bee on there that I did not know existed until I started looking at uh, what we had in our hedges and, and what they were supporting. Uh, so here's another great example from those that indexing. I, I, I said I'd talk about alyssum, and alyssum is, uh, we'll show you exactly uh, with the data, but it is probably one of the most powerful, um, most powerful um, beneficial plants that you can put to create a, a beneficial insectary. Uh, and because it, it's, it's part of that mustard family, but it's been, a, it, you know, you got cabbage, you got Brussels sprouts, um, again, actual mustard, mustard and canola for cooking oil. There's so much, uh, so much diversity in this family. Um, alyssum has been uh, selected for numerous and continuous blooming of these tiny, tiny little flowers. And even within the plant kingdom, it's unique for having very powerful aroma. And that aroma lends signals to the insect community that says, hey, come here. Uh, I got a little smorgasbord that's just the right size for you. And, um, you know, it's, it's better than what everybody else has got out there. So again, these unique tiny flowers are a good thing because they, um, they are the right size for a lot of those smaller insects that are smaller pests and also the smaller uh, predators. So again, thinking about the scale of the type of plant that you want to put in there. Um, yeah, another example uh, that I used personally was uh, uh, lance, leaf, lance leaf coreopsis or sand coreopsis. So this is kind of the tick seed family and there are a number of ornamental examples, but it just has a tremendous amount of um, attraction to specifically beneficial insects. And here's, here's the data. And th this is a real good chart. And e each one of those profiles that I showed above you from MSU, they have this. And this is done very well in, in that it, it, it starts early, like they are in order of when they bloom. And that's why I got two bars here because they connect throughout the, throughout the season. So um, again, so you can see that, that uh, sand coreopsis on the green chart, that's showing the natural level of pollinators or uh, of beneficial insects. So it's not that great on pollinators, but it is very good on um, beneficial insects. Uh, and it, again, it has the benefit of being a native um, plant. And again, so the other one that they have that's sh showing really great uh, abundance of beneficial uh, insects is uh, Angelica, which is, uh, it, it, it's an, an umbel. Um, it, so it has that compound inflorescence with lots of tiny little flowers, but it has a more upright growing pattern and it grows more in wet, moist areas. So that's one of the reasons where we chose the coreopsis because it's a little bit more drought tolerant um, than than the than the angelica, uh, and then, and then again, there's you know another good example. It's kind of neat, like you can see in the two different uh, scales on the bar charts. In the second chart, later in season, that magnitude of that scale is just so much higher because as the season goes on, there's more abundance. And those populations just start to explode. You get this, this, this almost like um, yeah, almost like a compound doubling effect where it it increases later in season. Uh, and so even though it's you know it's this this giant hyssop is only testing at twenty, uh, that's very similar or comparable to what the coreopsis was at that early stage and in, in the in the season or the angelica, uh, which is just put to shame by bone set. Uh, when you when you look at how 
how much there is there. Um, and then again, just another neat example, cup plant is really great for, for pollinators, not as uh, great for the natural enemies, but that's all just comparatively. There's still a lot of benefit and a lot of abundance. And that's something that this allows you to quantify um, how, how much impact you can have with your choice and your selection. And again, each one of those has a profile card and it tells you what they're attracting. So you have good clues about what you're gonna be increasing in, in your own backyard. So just, just a couple more examples of my own journey. And the, I'm not making recommendations, I'm just talking about what, what happened to me. And again, I decided to plant this Maximilian sunflower because it, would, it sounded really cool. It was a perennial sunflower, a sunflower that comes back every year. Um, you know, not like our, our annual sunflowers that we use for like sunflower oil or just for taking pictures of, <laughs> and, or selfies, I should say, because I'm still taking pictures of this sunflower. But the unique thing that happened when we planted it, um, A, this was really nice because it still bloomed in the first year, which was a, a big surprise. And I think that's really neat when you have a perennial and you can still get, um, get some flowers out of it in the first year, is that there was these little guys. So I was driving by them one day and I just saw these little specks in the, in the flower. And that is a long horned digger bee that I didn't even know existed until it showed up there. And it was already in our landscape. And guess what? It loves sleeping in these flowers. So that was kind of a little uh, thing that I enjoyed. And, and as I read more about it, then, okay, yeah, now that's part of the habitat that they like uh, at, a diff at, at a certain period in time. And with the continual blooming of the, that sunflower, it provides a lot, a, a lot of pollen and, you know, a neat place to sleep. So uh, again, here's the example of that, that Lacey Facelia. It's, it's a nice annual and it's a, a mega pollinator plant. Uh, we use that for a, some, some of our cover crops and, and some of our beneficial insectary plantings. Um, I talked a bit about beneficial insectaries and here's a little bit more examples of how you can do them. So in our strawberries, we planted, uh, the, the, here's the Coreopsis at the end of the row. Uh, and that worked out nicely because it was getting water and it was still out of the way uh, when we, we give all the plants a drink. Um, and then again, you, you can do a nice kind of alleyway of a, a row, like a, an, another strip kind of inside the planting versus at the end. And, and both provide these nice refuges for, um, for, for food and for, um, and, and um, you know, a, a place to, to build up um, numbers before they have to go in and are, are working the strawberries um, and, and uh, attacking the, the pests in there. So the Coreopsis was nice because it just, it just keeps blooming and uh, that's, that's a benefit to have that re repeat blooming all, all season long. The other one that I'm really impressed by um, is uh, Anna's hyssop. And uh, there's lots of different types of hyssops. Um, this one is named because it tastes like licorice and they all kind of do um, to a degree, but this one more so. Um, and again, you look, this, it's, it germinates really well from seed, as you can see from that tray. And again, uh, there, you take a look at that, that plant. Again, that's a, that was planted from a, a pot. So it, it was a different planting than that tr seeding tray, but you can count again over five different bees just on that one plant, and uh, and there's three different kinds of them. And again, that's the first time I saw a carpenter bee was on one of these plants. It's just that was that, and that's kind of why it has a special place in my heart. So going back to Lanceleaf coreopsis. You can, you can see that it was attractive to one of our major strawberry pests, the, the tarnished plant bug. And so that little bug there is, uh, you know, it's on there. And that's a benefit because it's on the flowers so I can see it earlier than when it's all in my canopy. It gives me that early warning. And again, it's something that it's more attractive than the, than the strawberry. So it kind of, it's a little bit of a bait and switch. Uh, which which does provide a benefit and makes it easier to control those insects. And again, here's here's different pollinators and predators. So you got the sweat bee, which is like it's it's bringing that to the field. It's bringing that pollination. You have the seraphid fly, a direct predator, going there, eating aphids, eating young larva or uh, eating young stages of tarnished plant bug and and other insects. And again, we have the miniature pirate bug that's just 
it's there hanging out, getting nectar, getting pollen, and uh, it's, yeah, building numbers and going into the berries, doing its work. So here's one way we planted the alyssum. We, it, again, like we could mow it and uh, it would still um, bounce back. We've since switched it to end row plantings at, uh, and then it gets so direct water and it really takes off there. But again, this, this is something that uh, we still use a lot of alyssum after trying it in a number of different ways because it just, it's just so, uh, so beneficial. Uh, so a little bit more on the anise hyssop. We did try it for, um, for beneficial insectaries. It's more of a benefit for pollinators. You do, so again, you see the tarnished plant bud, but we didn't see quite as many beneficials on it as we did pests. So it does serve a benefit in providing habitat. Um, but again, it, would, it, it did bloom the first year, but not as much as the alyssum as, uh, as an annual planting. So just an example again, so we're creating that food source, but then we're also uh, bringing in more predators uh, and then they, they use those plantings as a, as a, as a refuge and, and uh, something that builds up their population early and in advance. Uh, so we, plant, we, we started out by placing these little cards and, and sachets throughout the field. Um, and that took quite a bit of time with, it was you know, four guys working for four hours each to cover uh, 12 acres and, and now we're so happy with the results we've switched to putting it on with a tractor so and and it just so we can do it more often uh, and with less environmental impact than those little uh, little cards and sticker stickers uh, everywhere so it's it's something that's worked out well in our situation and I hope that that uh, here's the specific ones that we do apply and these these are working for for spider mites um, which are again another really tiny kind of spider and again we put out a lot of these aureuses and if they don't have a food source they don't they don't survive they don't they're not around so you, you have an investment if you don't have the the resources to support them it, it doesn't you don't get a return on that investment so those are two specific examples um, but again it's all built off that foundation of um, of native plants and I think that's, that's all I have at this point. Here's a list of our references. There was, again, there was a lot of other people's knowledge that contributed to this presentation. And I, I hope, you, hope you enjoyed it uh, as much as I enjoyed learning about it. And uh, yeah, appreciate your time. So if, if you have any questions, um, please uh, give myself uh, or, or Peter a, a, a chat, a shout through the, through the link. I'll just hop in and um, so I guess if you're okay to stay a little bit longer, there was a couple of questions really quickly. There was, so somebody was asking a little bit about, uh, you talked about Norway maples and we kind of established in the chat box that we know they're invasive. Uh, do you have any opinions on on that? On if yeah, I, I, I would agree. Yeah. Like, uh, I, it's kind of it, it's kind of that hard part where you again you have to look at uh, I don't like invasive species because they are you know they're uh, they they can bring diseases that affect uh, our our native species and are a net detriment to diversity. But again, what is good for what is bad for another plant can still be good for an insect, and as part of that transition, they're they're assets that you know. They, they're, they're doing something and if you discount that then you may have you may have a strength that you can bridge to a new future from um, so yeah again I, I think it's kind of unique in in, um, in the in that early springtime but again there's uh, there's still so many other things that uh, that would be worthwhile and again if there was a way that we could um, overcome uh, Dutch elm disease. It'd be better to have the elms than it would be to have the Norway maples, 100%. And yeah. <laughs> hey, there was a bit of a discussion too about gypsy moths and people asking, is it an issue where you are? And um, do you have any thoughts on gypsy moth? Has that been yeah. an issue with you? Yeah, we've seen we've seen that in like uh, there's uh, there's they'll take down some trees, which is kind of scary, um, but we. There's, they have developed a pheromone trap 
So it's, that's, a, you know, we talk quite a bit about reproduction of plants um, and, and insects, but this is a way if you stop that, you don't necessarily, necessarily need a predator if you need to stop them from completing their life cycle and doing that in a, a non-invasive, very, very targeted way. I think that's something that recently those, those traps have been available. Um, but again, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pressure on our, our local ecosystem. For sure, for sure. Okay, Bev says, any comments on BTK? And then what are your thoughts on the recent research about the negative impacts of honeybees on native bees? Yeah, so uh, BTK, it, it, it only works on that kind of larval stage. And again, it's, it's it's a it, some of them can be specific, but the that's Bacillus thuringiensis, and then they'll have subspecies that uh, are that that are more tailored to different um, you know whether it's moths or beetles. There's some different different differences in how they work. Um, they work okay, like they but they you you have to use them earlier on, and and you have to watch out for some of the potential effects on you know if 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 you're not very careful how you can use it, then you can be uh, disadvantaging some other moths uh, that you may want to keep around at that point in time. And um, yeah, the I think that that I alluded to that in my talk about uh, we care a lot about honeybees, but that's I that's only a very small part of the diversity picture. And I think we do it selfishly because they give us something sweet that we enjoy and it makes us feel good, but. I, I think uh, it's a good way to bridge to a greater understanding of pollinators and creating habitat. The challenge is if you want to support uh, honeybees, buy honey. You want to support native pollinators, how do you do that? It's a lot more complicated. And, and that's why I try, I try and use honeybees as that platform to have the discussion about uh, native bees. Uh, like we, we sell a watermelon honey. And I say, we don't, whenever I get a chance to talk about it, we only have this watermelon honey because there's not enough squash bees. It's just, it's just that simple. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I, I know, you know, I, I know <laughs> our, our watermelon farmer, uh, he's a dear friend and uh, he, he tries to have as many squash bees as he can to, to provide that uh, pollination, but there's just not enough in, and he, he lives near a conservation area and there's tons of habitat. But well, there's not enough uh, bees to or squash bees to to get that crop fully pollinated. So I think it, it's it's part of a longer term discussion about um, what are the native pollinators, how do we support them, uh, and uh, yeah, then that, that's a little bit of the challenge I think we have again. How do we um, how do we meet our our meet our needs uh, for for food? while also not uh, natively affecting other forms of life's um, need for their own food. And uh, if we can start to build more and more abundance and more and more habitat, then I think we have an opportunity to not necessarily have to pick a side, but at least create more abundance. It's good for everybody. And then there's less competition between the different insects. That's great. Thank you. Um, I do know that you have to head out. So if you wanted to head out, you are welcome to, to leave. Um, one other question we had, though, was any plans on Alice creating an Oxford County branch? <laughs> um, we, we've, uh, we've heard that a couple times. And, you know, I live fairly close uh, to Oxford. And, you know, the best way to do that is, uh, you know, it's, you saw that public uh, advisory committee at the beginning. That's how Alice Middlesex was created. It's just enough people saying, you know what, I think this Alice concept works and reaching out to, to Alice uh, Canada. Um, there's the Eastern Co Hub Coordinator, Alyssa Kuzner. That's her job is to work with new uh, existing and emerging. Got a grant from uh, the Trillium Foundation and that's what helped create Alice Middlesex. There's no doubt about it and it's good to see um, with Reforest London as well, and so that's that's the opportunity is to uh, get the get the group of people that believes in the concept and uh, work to work with the 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 don't the funder pool that's out there. And the great part about being part of Alice is that there's this big national family, 
and Alice Canada wants more chapters. They want to be able to do more rehabilitation and they're, they're working to advocate with the donors to, to make that happen as well. So that's, that's what, yeah, unfortunately, like the good things about local is that they're local and uh, I just hope that people, uh, Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, you're right. It's totally a grassroots sort of initiative. Um, my internet cut out there slightly for a second, so I hope I got the end of that. But uh, it seems to be the end for the questions. Um, well, thank you so much again. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Peter, for being here. I think if there's anything else, um, you can always reach out there to the alice.middlesex at gmail.com. As mentioned, this is going to be, uh, it's recorded, so it'll be sent out in a couple of days. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight and um, have a great night. I hope you learned a lot. I sure did. <laughs> Thank you, Kelsey. Thanks everyone.